The first time I came to Nauvoo was 10 years ago with my family. We had rented a, an RV and decided to, to travel across country to see all the, the church history sites. My wife uh, noticed that the art gallery was open, not wanting to, to miss an opportunity to go shopping, uh, went in there with, with my daughter. The proprietor at the time grabbed my daughter and said, hey, I, I have something for you. Took her back into a storeroom and retrieved a, a piece of the original Nauvoo temple uh, and gave it to her as a keepsake. Until this day, my daughter's kept that on her bedside table as a memento from that trip and of how important that was for her. So now we fast forward 10 years and uh, I found myself looking for some different business opportunities and saw listed a location that said a hotel, art gallery, and a mercantile near a major religious site. My wife, she kind of looked at me and said, hey, if that's that one place that we went to in Nauvoo, uh, you're going to need to get it. And so as I investigated it further, I found that, that this actually was the, the same place. And so we came out and spoke with the previous owners and, and struck a deal. Literally, I don't want to say five minutes after, but almost five minutes after the, the acquisition, we walked over and showed us where this, this sprinkler head was uh, out front. The, the final sprinkler head, they couldn't get it to seat low enough so that the lawnmowers wouldn't damage the head. And so the landscaper you know, pulled the soil back and there was a, a rock underneath there. And as he pulled that, that rock out, it exposed a red brick archway underneath the sidewalk. So immediately I was like, you know, let me get my Indiana Jones outfit and uh, let's, let's figure out what this is. And it appeared that they were either part of a, of a room or a tunnel. And that really got me intrigued on this whole concept of tunnels. And I initially thought, well, I wonder if this was Joseph's tomb. At the time, uh, we have William Weeks drawings and we have a couple of comments made by people like Alpheus Cutler saying that they go by and see Joseph um, and he's sitting at his tomb that's under construction and watching the building of the temple. So it gives us some ideas of its proximity. As I've done some research and studying on that topic, which is actually a topic I had no idea even, even existed, it is amazing how important the idea of the tomb relates back to church history and the martyrdom and what happened post-martyrdom. So to me, it, it's, it's kind of an integral piece of history that almost nobody knew about. So whether it was built as part of the temple structure itself, whether it was across the street, you know, I, we're, we're going to speculate on that for a while. Maybe your film will come up uh, with the answer. From the time I first arrived in Nauvoo, I met people that had great stories about the tunnels, uh, people that wanted to show me their wine cellars. Um, and ultimately, um, local historians would usually debunk these. This, Chris, this isn't the tomb. This is a, a German wine cellar, or this is a tunnel that was built in the, the Icarian era of Nauvoo. Well, I've heard stories about um, underground tunnels from the uh, temple site to allow people to escape, but I hadn't heard about the arch in the Zions Mercantile building until about a year and a half ago. But it still remains this kind of enigma of where really was it? We know it was south. Was it southeast? Was it southwest? Was it two blocks away? Was it on the temple block? The church bought a few years back what uh, another amateur historian had thought was the tomb only to find out that it pretty much documented as a wine cellar. Um, and of course, the interest as to whether that vault underneath the Mulholland would, could be a tomb, um, doubtful. Then this has to be the tomb. Oh. You, got the, you got the door? <laughs> it, it does kind of excite that, you know, what are we going to find, you know, treasure hunt, you know, mode that I think everybody kind of has. You know, you, you wouldn't have all of the Discovery Channel stuff about Barry, about, you know, recovering the lost ark or, or the lost gold of Montezuma, or back then it was hoping to discover the gold. You know, the old timers always thought that the, 
Joseph buried a lot of gold in Nauvoo. I think you almost have to have the legend of some treasure buried that people can be seeking forever after. My grandma is Mary Logan. She was born in Nauvoo in 1924 and tells many stories of her childhood growing up here. One of the stories that sticks out in my mind is her playing on the grounds of the original Nauvoo Temple. Our school building was on Temple Square and our playground was on Temple Square. Oh, yeah, there were several ball fields, we called them. The baseball, some kind of a ball anyhow, shared the bats. <laughs> and a group of friends were playing a game of baseball on what was the original Nauvoo Temple grounds. And she went to run home and then disappeared down a hole. very much, except that I was down, down. She had a big arch, stone arch, or an arch, and it was stone. And she did have to wait for help to come get her. They had to get a ladder to get her out. There's just so much history that's happened here that it just makes it fascinating on every turn that you learn something new, some new aspect of church history that you didn't know before. It's a wilderness, Joseph. But it's a prime location for a port, just before the rapids. Yeah, Iowa side. Might be a better place. Yes, it's true we have possibilities on both sides of the river. Joseph, it's a marsh. This dampness can't be healthy. I've heard some type of miasma attacks every summer. We can dig canals, drain the excess water. When the saints arrived in Nauvoo, it was a swamp. There were a few homes uh, set up on the marsh and up on the bluff, but in general, it was a swamp, which is why they were never able to find permanent settlers, and it was all this land that they were hoping to unload on the Latter-day Saints. I don't know that the brethren will be up for the, <laughs> the labor. Oh, look how well everything grows here. It doesn't matter all the variety that there is. The sun is brilliant and direct and long in the hours of the day. I wish Dad could see us. I wish he were here. Hiram Smith was the second most powerful man in Nauvoo. 
He held so many powerful positions and responsibilities that Joseph Smith truly saw him as a right-hand man. At the same time, Joseph and Hiram did not always see in line with one another. Joseph was more willing to explore new possibilities, consider new doctrines. But that's the journey with the true and living God, is every step is new, the path is forever new. He's the master of new life. Hiram Smith was always much more traditional. Joseph, it's just too wet. You can't build a solid foundation here. Look at this. But I've asked the Lord, what wilt thou have me do? And he's told me, build up a city here and call my saints to this place. We'll call Nauvoo. The city is beautiful. Beautiful. Nauvoo. And up there on the bluff, we'll build God's temple. That has a solid foundation. <laughs> when the church and, and Joseph Smith and the church leaders acquired the site, it was originally known as Commerce, uh, Illinois, and uh, it, was a, it was a swamp. The way the, the water table works in Nauvoo, there's the, the flats uh, down near the river, and then you climb a bluff. All of the water, that, that the rains that fall on that upper bluff flow down that downslope to the floodplain of the Mississippi. The water just sat there malaria, uh, mosquito infested, on the flats especially. And yet Joseph tried to make this into the city beautiful. Uh, Nauvoo renames the place. And so they decide to, to create a series of channels and divert the water. Um, canals, mini canals and, and channels that would divert the water as it came down uh, from the bluff and then try to channel it off the wet areas towards the river. And that dries out the land dramatically and makes it the rich farmland that exists today and certainly uh, makes it inhabitable. Uh, 175 years later, we're still digging in the Nauvoo dirt. But now we're looking to uncover what happened back then. And as we spoke to many locals about the tomb of Joseph and where it could be, the, you know, a lot of the local historians, all fingers were pointing to Joseph Johnston from all different angles. And so because everybody was pointing to that one guy, that led me to believe, well, he's definitely somebody that we need to have in on this project. Oh, watch your feet coming down. This is amazing. I am already glad I have a mask on. Yeah. So look at this brickwork. Oh, hey, look at this. This is really interesting. Look at this. Wow, this is cool. This has got to be from the temple. This has got to be one of the doors to the temple. Wow. This is the lintel to the temple. That is an incredible piece. It just looks like the archway was purposeful. Yeah, this archway is definitely intentional. In some of the old pictures, of the old Ashner building. There's a water pump right here. So this is a cistern. You think it's a cistern? Yeah, that's why we've got the plaster on the walls like this. That's, that's, uh, that's exactly what this is. This is a cistern. If this space were a tomb, how would it have been designed? And why would it have been designed that way? If it were a tomb, we'd have to have two doors. You'd have like little niches Okay. Uh, for to be a little crypt. So I guess we'll have to have to keep looking. Yeah, OK. Oh, stuck in the mud here again. He's a very eccentric individual, to, to say the least. However, very knowledgeable and very enthusiastic, which is endearing in somebody that's bringing history to life. Well, Mulholland Street used to be known as Mudholland Street, so it could be some kind of a drainage ditch for it, even. Hmm, OK. We've, of course, got lots of stories of tunnels in Nauvoo running from everywhere, uh, from the temple down to the, to the mansion house, even. Uh, but if you want to talk about the tomb, we got several different sites. We're located in a terrific spot to start talking about it. I saw that he did a paper that, that I was able to find on the internet, which had some compelling evidence about different locations. And in fact, in this paper, he referenced different locations where the tomb could be. You know, for the, the locals here in Nauvoo, they know of, of several different locations 
that the tomb possibly could have been, you know, including even a, a grove of trees here behind the, the property. You can see, no trespassing. It's a good thing I know the owners and I got permission for us to come down here. Oh, well, that's really handy then. Let's do that. It's a mess to get to, but when you get up in here, you've got this beautiful arch here, uh, nicely finished stone. And this is a great spot, great existing spot that would be great for a tomb, but it doesn't fit it being so far from the temple. And now that this arch has fallen, you can look up here and see that we are made of temple stone rubble. There's also the problem with it looks nothing like the William Weeks drawing. We've got just the single vault, no double vault. And in order to have a water feature like is in the William Weeks drawing, the water would have to be coming what down this not, way not. and going into, into the tomb. The tomb which would not be a good idea. I spoke to the former owner's name's Robert Cook. When I told him that, that we were you know, interested in, in trying to figure out where Joseph's tomb was, he said, but it's interesting that you mentioned that because when we were replacing floorboards in the back part of the hotel, which would have been the, the dining hall area, he said when they pulled up the floorboards, they saw a red brick arch. Uh, underneath the, the floorboards. Is this where you remember the arch being? No, I remember it over there. Oh, so we're kind of digging in the wrong end. Yeah, I think the wrong, spot. The wrong end. <laughs> okay. <laughs> So I was so excited to, to get that hole opened up over there to find what Robert was talking about with the, the arch. And when Robert came and we showed him and he said, no, that's just the, the crawl space. And he just kind of matter of fact, they pointed over here and said, no, the arch is over here. So now we're gonna tear this part up. What do you see down there? Nothing, more, more crawl space. I see nothing. <laughs> no way. No way. What do you say you see in there? I see nothing. It was taking so much effort to tear my new hotel apart, it made me wonder how the Saints could possibly build a whole city, the largest in Illinois, in only four years. Where's my Diet Coke? Right there. <laughs> the Mormons arrived in Illinois at a very opportune time. The state was just trying to get out of an economic stagnation. The state was very anxious to bring in new immigrants and new settlers because they wanted more financial income. So when they saw these thousands of Mormon immigrants arriving on the Illinois shore, they're thinking, hey, if we can welcome these Mormons and show them that we are their friends, they're gonna vote for us in the next few elections. You have journeyed very far. We have the, the growing British mission at this time, and that brings in thousands of Latter-day Saints with their skills and talents and abilities. I think there are several things that allowed Nauvoo to happen uh, the way that it did, I mean, so quickly. First of all, this isn't the first city, of course, where, where the Saints have gathered. Uh, I think they learned things in each of their various communities along the way. They had already built a temple city uh, in Kirtland, and I think they learned from that experience. They tried to build communities in Missouri. Uh, Joseph built a, a Zion community in Independence, and, and that hadn't worked out, but Joseph learned from that. 
So I think Joseph takes lessons he learned from Kirtland, lessons he learned from Missouri. And when he comes into Illinois, there were people who weren't pleased with that talk. There were people who felt like, you know, we, we shouldn't gather together as a people. We shouldn't be together as one. And yet Joseph had a vision. Um, he knew that, uh, that the church needed to have headquarters. It needed to be together as one. It, it would survive, uh, it could thrive if the people could come together as one and build a temple. You will have peace and joy this way, this way. I think there are few individuals in American history who can match the charisma, energy, and drive of Joseph Smith. Uh, his ability to motivate people, abilities to connect with followers, to inspire people to, to do incredibly difficult things. He, he must have had a, a magnetic personality. Oh, that horse just threw a shoe. Kiss your mothers. Thank you, Joseph. Uh, of course, tell your father that you can use my plow as long as he wants. Yeah? It's in those first few years, as they're trying to build this new city on the swamplands, that Joseph Smith starts preaching the importance of not only families, but families maintaining a role in the eternities. Only a few years, Joseph, and you've managed to put the miseries of Missouri behind us. The saints? No, it's the will of God. They just need the strength to carry it out. Do you think that frolicking with the boys is <laughs> proper behavior for a prophet of God? <laughs> Relax, Hiram. If my mingling with the boys makes them happy and draws their hearts closer to mine, who knows? There may be young men among them who someday lay down their lives for me. He's still only a boy himself. The boy I married. Initially, what he offered them was what the New Testament offered. He said, come into this church and be baptized and you'll be saved, period. There was a time up until 1840 when occasionally he would be asked, well, what about those who died before they were baptized? And his response was, God's a pretty powerful guy, he'll fix it. Don't worry about it. Your plans are remarkable, Brother William. Truly, you are designing the house of God, just as I saw it in my vision. Thank you, Brother Joseph. Some people have the ability to connect with the spiritual world in a very significant way. At least in the reorganized church literature, he, he's referred to as prophet and seer. You are, without a doubt, the man I want to build our temple. Still. There are some changes that need to be made. How can I help? There are no round windows on the sides. He understood the life beyond this physical life in ways that, that we can't comprehend. William, do you remember my vision? I will have round windows, even if you have to make the temple 10 feet higher. I have seen the splendid appearance of the building illuminated, and I will have it built according to the pattern shown me. How do the plans look? Thanks to Brother Weeks, the temple will be everything we hoped for. When we talk about William Weeks' drawings of the Nauvoo Temple, where does that conversation turn to? It turns to issues of eternal familial relationships. It turns to friendships. It turns to eternal records. I think it's beautiful, and I think it's significant in understanding who Joseph was as a person. There's something else that's been... <laughs> There's something else I need. Son Hiram Jr. passed away with the fever. And then our younger brother and Joseph's newborn son, both named Don Carlos, died within a few days of each other. All this preceded by the passing of our father. 
for him to live with his family and be buried with his family was one in the same thought. We need a tomb, William. Somewhere on the temple plot where we can lay our family. That the idea that all would arise from their literal graves on the day of resurrection would have meant to him, OK, if we can be buried together, then we'll all be resurrected and reunited together. I want to be with my father. I miss him so much. Sacred to me is his dust. Sacred to me is the tomb we will build to encircle his head. Hiram and I wish to strike hands with our father on the morning of the resurrection. Let our children we have buried be gathered and placed in this tomb. Let our mother and sisters be laid there also, and let it be called the tomb of Joseph a descendant of Jacob. And when I die, let me be gathered to the tomb of my father. Can you make such a tomb for us, Brother Will? Yes, Brother Joseph, I could do it. Do you have a plan in mind, something I can follow? This is a rendering of President Harrison's tomb, which will be built in Ohio. It's said that the design is based on the ancient tomb built for Joseph of Egypt. And this was a very powerful doctrine, saying that this is not the last time you will see your beloved kin. You will see them in the next life, which will be a continuation of the joys and unions we feel in this life. So when I think of a Smith family tomb in Nauvoo, it is the physical embodiment of this hope of familial unity of a continuation of the family in the next life, all found in where these bodies are going to reside in the meantime. So were tombs common back in, in the day of the, the saints when they were here? No, not really. Only the really rich or the really important got tombs. See, like uh, William Henry Harrison got one. Okay. And his, his is what Joseph Smith's tomb was based on. This is an 1842 lithograph of Harrison's tomb. Wow, cool. Came across this and noticed a lot of similarities between this and Joseph's tomb. The architecture is very similar. So do you think this picture would have been available for the, has been widely distributed? Absolutely, yeah. This is by Courier, the most famous lithographer in the United States at the time. A couple of years later, that's when he joins up with his famous partner, Ives. Oh, so Courier and Ives, okay. Yeah. I thought we said by Courier, like meant by mailman or something. Yeah. Okay, <laughs> all right. I'm glad he clarified that. Harrison was the most famous man in the country, of course. President of the United States, first time a president had died in office. Now, did the saints like Harrison? They did, actually. Okay. All of the Latter-day Saints, when they voted in the presidential election, they voted for Harrison. So it makes sense that if, if a tomb were to be built for Joseph, that it would be very similar to, to Harrison's, possibly right. in construction and, and type, I guess. Yeah. So the, the vault that, that we have underneath the ground measures seven feet wide by 27 feet long. Does that match this drawing at all? That's almost perfect for this drawing, okay. actually. It's interesting to note that, that the ceiling here. And right here they show the ceiling. You yeah. can see the brick, the oh, architecture. Isn't that interesting? Is We've got stone. On the side, yeah. Yeah, like ours. But definitely, the, the architecture is very similar to what we're looking at inside the vault. Hey, Jim, you got tension on the straps? Yeah, it looks good. We good? Go real slow. Back it up okay. just a titch. The Keep people going. of Nauvoo were starting to notice the bizarre activities going on in front of Zion's Mercantile with the unifying more. consensus. The owner okay, must be cuckoo more. for Cocoa Puffs. No more. OK, stop. OK. In fact, we were just trying to enlarge the opening to give us easier access to the vault. Hold it right there. I'm going to cut it. We're a couple of feet from the ground, so I'm going to cut the strap. OK. Good. Clear now. 
now. The search was getting more and more exciting. It turns out there was a lot more to discover about this vault and its possible connection to the tomb of Joseph. We even found these frogs with giant bug eyes that had never seen the light of day. Joseph Smith, he's a very complicated man. We can argue whether he was divinely inspired or whether he just believed he was, but I, I don't question that he believed he was. Joseph Smith was like an intellectual sponge that he saw good anywhere and he would just you know, soak that up and that would become part of everything that was building up inside this sponge. But he had good reasons for doing it. He would see good and it's like, I want that too. I want that in the LDS church. To see this editorial in the Warsaw Signal written by Thomas Sharp. A proclamation has been recently issued by the presidents of the Church of Latter-day Saints, Mormons, calling upon all who are converts to the new faith to take up their residence as soon as possible at or in the vicinity of Nauvoo. This city having recently received a charter of the most liberal character, the Mormons have determined to make it the gathering place of the saints throughout the earth. Whatever may be thought of the tenets of this sect, it is certainly an imposing spectacle to witness the moral power which in so short a period they have exerted. He seems supportive, like most of our neighbors have been so far. I think they approve of how our city has improved Hancock County. Wait till they see our glorious temple. The Latter-day Saints have a habit of making a lot to do on April 6th every year. That's the church's anniversary. So in April 6th, 1841, the church announced that they were going to have a huge cornerstone dedication ceremony for the new Nauvoo Temple. Joseph Smith, in his mind, this was a demonstration of how far they have come. They had only been in Nauvoo for two years, but now we have so much going for us. And on that day, they invited dignitaries from nearby cities, state politicians. Stephen A. Douglas, who was a state senator, showed up. Thomas Sharp from the nearby Warsaw Signal, who had been giving the church some positive coverage at that point, showed up. Is this going to be the church's chance to put on a show? The Nauvoo militia came out. The Nauvoo Legion was their private military. Every male in Nauvoo between the ages of 20 and 45 had to enlist in the Nauvoo Legion. To the saints, this was a demonstration of how powerful they were, how far they have come from being defenseless in Missouri. To those outside of Nauvoo, of course, this was a private army at the hands of a religious leader who does not seem to have his full allegiance to the state. So all this is going to be is potential problems down the road. And in fact, Joseph Smith had so much control over the Nauvoo Legion that they appointed him Lieutenant General of the Nauvoo Legion. Joseph Smith was the first individual in America since George Washington to be granted that title. And the saints believed that this Nauvoo Legion was going to be their last bastion of liberty if everything falls apart. Emma Smith has always been a complicated figure for me. And I think that's what drew me to her. There are people that put her on a pedestal and love her. There are people that look down on her for not coming west with Brigham Young and the rest of the saints. But we also know that she did amazing things, that she was the first president of the Nauvoo Relief Society, that she compiled the first hymn book. Emma and Joseph had been through a lot together. They complimented each other so well. He wasn't as educated as she was or as business savvy as she was. But she was able to complement that and to fill in the parts where he was focusing on the church. You are looking lovely this fine morning, madam. And you are very handsome, General Smith. She believed in him and in his role as prophet throughout her life, um, but they saw a lot together. 
So if you're looking at this as an outsider, then you certainly see what looks like megalomania. That here's a man who was always reaching himself for something a little bit or a lot higher, but also offering to his believers something that was continually being accelerated. And what of the Nauvoo Legion, sir? We're quite proud of the progress they've made in such a short time. This surprises me. This is William Weeks, the distinguished architect who has designed our temple. Hmm. And this is the great Chief Kyokuk. I gave him a Book of Mormon two years ago, and we've been friends ever since. <laughs> Some takeaway about Joseph is how tremendously busy he is just a, a ridiculous amount of responsibilities that he's in charge of. But to outsiders, that's very threatening. All is well. All is well. But to those who were visiting that day, they saw something else, especially Thomas Sharp. Thomas Sharp had previously been somewhat friendly to the Latter-day Saints, but now he comes to this cornerstone ceremony sees Joseph Smith dressed up in his military regalia, referred to as a lieutenant general, and he sees thousands of men marching at Joseph Smith's command. And he sees, oh my gosh, we have a religious tyrant uh, who is more akin to Muhammad than any other American military leader. That this Nauvoo Legion and Joseph Smith at their helm is a threat to democratic order. This principal cornerstone is now duly laid in honor of the great God, that the saints may have a place to worship God, and the Son of Man may have where to lay his head. Amen. And so this great cornerstone ceremony that the Latter-day Saints hoped was going to be their coming out party end up being and serving as an omen for the conflict that was to come. This is the loveliest place and the best people under the heavens. Little do they know the trials that await them. Mulholland Street in Nauvoo is generally pretty calm and peaceful. However, that was all about to change when the heavy equipment arrived. But hey, we've got to start the excavation for the new Tomb of Joseph Museum. They did all this in a week. That's moving. Well, I think they've already found it. Oh, what's that? Oh, the tomb. Did you see the? You can see the tomb if you stand over there. See back underneath the sidewalk. It's pretty amazing. You think they'll turn it into a museum? I hope so. Good morning. <laughs> Glad you could make it. Thanks for coming, bud. Thank you. You betcha. So we've got some some cool stuff. We're we're doing some excavation in front of the vault, and so well, I'll take you down and we'll show. Quite the hole you've made. Yeah. <laughs> oh wow! Look at that. So you can see as we come come down and you get a view of the of the wall. We've got the limestone wall here uh -huh. that, was, that was plastered. You can see the red brick inside there that you know may be the, right. the red Nauvoo brick. But if you notice right here, there's a pipe sticking out right there. But if you follow the pipe, you can see it comes right down into right. the center of the vault, 
just like we saw in the drawings to the tomb of Joseph. And that pipe actually came around, and this is where it's really cool. Okay. We've got a well right here that that <laughs> pipe went that. down in. Yeah, so that pipe just kind of came along and then angled right over to the well. But that kind of caught me off guard. I did not expect to see a water feature yeah. directly underneath That's the That's kind of unusual. Ball. So what do you think? It's very interesting. Very interesting. The plot thickens. It does thicken. Yeah. Good speculation. Okay. <laughs> Worth an investigation, yeah, that's for sure. Absolutely. Because we got the, the red brick inside there. Yes. But then you immediately have a, a limestone wall on the outside. Yes. Well, the, the, the barrel vault constructed out of the red brick is very intriguing. It's strong. Obviously, it's been there for many, many years. I mean, if we, if we just got rid of the soft material, Oh, that's pour, what, that's pour what I meant. up on both sides. So what we're doing is we're relieving you know, the structural pressure off of this wall. OK. So that we can leave this wall exposed you know, as part of the exhibit. We'll have structural steel beams spanning from one side to the other, and then a metal deck and then a concrete cap okay. on, on top of that. So we started to get some press now that we started the excavation in front of the mercantile. So I wanted to show you the first local news clip. Local news is always good. Cover whether a tomb is the final resting place of the founder of the Mormon faith. Crews are excavating a vault uh, found under the Zion's final resting place. Abu. Owner George Christensen says there are a number of indicators <laughs> like location and building materials George. that give credence to the Go theory by that Joseph Smith is buried there. But Christensen says even if it's not the tomb, he still has plans to turn the space into a historical exhibit. Let, let's see, we need to correct that that was not ever the final resting place, even if it is the tomb. Right. Have you heard anything from the local community about excavation and, and what's going on with the project? Yeah, people are definitely interested in what's going on. You know, anytime a hole is dug in Nauvoo, everybody's got to know about it. One of the funniest things that happened as a result of the excavation is is actually somebody called into the city offices that they heard that we found a dead body. So, so they actually had to come and investigate to make sure we didn't find a dead body in the excavation. Right. So, uh, I hadn't so, heard that. That's terrific. So definitely the, the word is getting around in different forms. Yeah, we call that the Nauvoo rumor mill. Yes, yeah, for sure. I think the rough edges that we needed to smooth over with many in the community, I think we've managed to do that. And I think at, at this point, everybody's kind of anxious to, to see the film, see how it comes out, to make sure that, that we're not portraying something to be something that it's, that it's not, or something more than, than what it actually was. And I think with Joseph being you know, a, a historian that, that has a lot of credibility around town, Hopefully that can help bridge the gap, because I'm, I'm a newcomer to, to Nauvoo, and so they see me as kind of a wild card, that they don't know that, you know, that I'll, I'm gonna be a straight shooter. So it's important that, that we make sure that we present the, the information exactly as the historical record shows it. Read and ponder to those citizens, if any there are, who apprehend no danger from a Mormon ascendancy in this county. Pay strict attention. It is said that many have determined to leave. Letters have been sent to England warning their friends who had designed to emigrate of the sad state of things in the city of the church. This isn't true. None of it's true. He wishes to scare away the converts before they even step onto a ship to come here. Hiram, write this down. Sir, you will discontinue my paper. Its contents are calculated to pollute me. That tissue of lies, that sink of iniquity, is disgraceful to any moral man. Yours with utter contempt. <laughs> nice touch. Well, I mean, he hasn't even seen what's going on here. 
Thomas Sharp probably headed up the sentiment of those who were not happy that their comfortable lifestyle was going to be challenged by this group that grew increasingly large. Uh, and I think you could say hate. Highly important. A new revelation from Joe Smith, the Mormon prophet. If the leader and head of a religious group can exercise such an all-powerful influence over his deluded followers, if his will is to be their law and be their God, what will become of your dearest rights and most valued privileges? The old guard and uh, would look for every opportunity to be offended. And of course, you know, we gave offense as well as we took offense. <laughs> So it's in Nauvoo that you have the temple theology developing. It's in Nauvoo where you have the idea of endowment, of second anointing, of ordaining people to be kings and queens. All of that's going on in the Nauvoo period. And the big lightning rods seem to be the stories about polygamy, which was then and is now still somewhat of a mystery about exactly what was going on at that time. So when Joseph Smith starts introducing the doctrine of polygamy, first he came to believe that polygamy was central to his salvific mission, that the doctrine of sealing multiple families together through these new polygamous rituals was going to create a connected web that was necessary to ensure salvation in the eternities. Yet at the same time, he fervently believed that any leakage of this information or the spreading of this knowledge was going to lead to the downfall of not only the polygamous project, but Mormonism in general. On three separate occasions, he claimed that he was visited by an angel that demanded his participation in plural marriage and his teaching plural marriage, um, until finally that the third angel insisted that he introduce this to the saints you know, the message is clear. Either you participate in this or uh, you're no longer needed. I knew that Emma really struggled with polygamy. I think she probably became aware of the troubles that were ahead of her. One of the problems was that Joseph was sealed to some of her friends and people that she didn't know that he was sealed to. And so there was a sense of betrayal in that and a sense of abandonment and wondering how their relationship would work. And I think both of them were in a really hard place. July of 1843 was a really tricky time. In one moment, Emma seems willing to accept this precept. Then the next, she threatens divorce. I'm not sure what to do. I'm sure she'll listen to reason if presented in the right way. Give me the revelation on celestial marriage, and I will read it to Emma word for word. I'm confident I can convince her of its truth. He believed that he had a really good relationship with his sister-in-law and that he would be able to convince her of the truthfulness of polygamy. Joseph knew his wife better and he said, You don't know Emma as well as I do. Joseph having been commanded by the Lord to practice this ancient law and Emma claiming her rights as his wife and as someone who loved him and he loved her and he knew that this was hurting her and she was feeling abandoned and betrayed. I have never received a more severe talking to in my entire life. So there's a breach of friendship um, for Emma and for many of the women. It was, it was a hard time. It was a complicated time. And it's heartbreaking. Scent of my husband lies faint on my pillow. Trial 
Angels pursue me in life's dreary path. Oh, sisters, oh, sisters, oh, sisters, oh, we are not alone. Oh, sisters, oh, sisters, oh, sisters, oh, faith will bring us home. A nation reviles us, we must live in shadows. I'm lonely, sisters, come close to me. The men are in hiding, the babies are crying. We stand in the light of God's blessed Son. Oh, sisters, oh, sisters, oh, sisters, oh, we are not alone. Oh, sisters, oh, sisters, oh, sisters, oh, faith will bring us home. Scent of my husband lies faint on my pillow. The young wife, the fields, the priesthood all call. Oh, sisters, oh, sisters, oh, sisters, oh, we are not alone. Sisters, oh, sisters, oh, sisters, oh, faith will bring us home. Faith will bring us home. I think this shows how complicated it was to be a Latter day Saint in Nauvoo in 1843 and 1844. I often tell people, when you're studying the history of Nauvoo, you have to remember that Missouri was last week. And what I mean is, it is one continuous struggle for the saints. And Nauvoo doesn't exist by itself. It exists in the context of everything that happened in Missouri. And everything that happened in Missouri comes with them. And the people who were offended there weren't, didn't suddenly decide that they were OK with the Mormons. Joseph. Porter, 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 you blessed soul. How many miles have you walked to get here? 13, Joseph, days, Joseph, not miles, days. 13 days, all on foot. They arrested me 10 months ago in St. Louis, but, but brother Joseph, they could not prove me guilty of trying to murder old Governor Boggs. <laughs> Although, <laughs> he well deserved it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm back to protect you from the enemies of God's work. <laughs> oh, Porter, my friend, I prophesy in the name of the Lord that you, Oren Porter Rockwell, so long as thou shalt remain loyal and true to thy faith, need fear no enemy. Cut not thy hair, and no bullet or blade can harm thee. <laughs> Thanks, Joseph. I was planning that to be the case anyways. <laughs> <laughs> there is another thing. I've heard news in Missouri. You have enemies near you. Thank you, Porter, but I've never been without enemies. The good Lord has constituted me so curiously that... That I glory in persecution. No. All hell boil over and I'll always come out on top. No, this, this is different. This is different. You have enemies in your midst. Who you call friends. You are, Joseph. I'm exposed to far greater danger from traitors amongst us and from enemies without. So William Law and his associates publish a newspaper in Nauvoo that is highly inflammatory, uh, known as the Nauvoo Expositor. 
and uh, it was seeking to expose Joseph Smith, some of his teachings, among them uh, teachings on plural marriage. And perhaps one of the things that strikes you while reading over the Nauvoo Expository is how much they were still believers. So they contained their testimonies of what true Mormonism was. They contained details of how Joe Smith was corrupting it. They had affidavits detailing how Joe Smith was practicing polygamy. They were expressing that they were the true believers in Mormonism and that Joseph Smith was a fallen prophet. Joseph Smith, of course, saw this expositor from the moment of its arrival as the biggest threat to his community as they had faced yet. Joseph Smith immediately calls the city council together and he urged the city council, we need to take radical action on this expositor. Otherwise, we're all done for. We have now met thrice on this matter, and it's time to act. Yes. Here. What the opposition party wanted to do was to raise a mob on us and take the spoils of us. We must finally strike a blow. Yes. Here, here. God no longer requires us to submit to the oppression of our enemies, be they outside or inside our community. Before I will consent that this paper continue to defame our wives, our sisters, our daughters, I will lay my body against the walls of their building. The city council, though, was filled with individuals saying, whoa, 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 Joseph, let's take a breath. Let's slow down. Are you sure we can't just ignore it? But both Joseph and Hiram at these meetings says no. I consider the expositor a public nuisance. We therefore have the legal right granted by our city charter to end its publication. I believe the best way is to smash the press all to pieces and buy the type. Joseph Smith gets in front of the city council and says, we have to destroy this press. Otherwise, this whole city is going to be trampled on the ground. And in fact, he even said that I would rather die than let this press exist another day. Terms that ended up proving somewhat prophetic. And Hiram Smith says that we are not going to have peace in this city until we destroy the press and pie the type, meaning smash it into the ground. If you look at Joseph Smith's whole life, it's like a tapestry of many threads. And a lot of those threads were going in a tragic direction by the end of his life. One of those was the destruction of the Nauvoo Expositor. That's a highly un-American thing to do, and it really was a bridge too far for those both out of the church and those who had been in the church the idea that he would have such a blatant attack on freedom of the press really was one step too far. It was at that moment that the dissenters within the church and the opponents outside the church were finally able to clasp hands and form a, a unified resistance that Joseph Smith couldn't outrun. In the words of non-Mormon neighbors, Mormons were above the law meaning that no longer could they be curtailed through legal endeavors. Joseph Smith ordered the destruction of the Nauvoo Expositor, and the dissenters run to Warsaw to tell their story, and Thomas Sharp immediately publishes a special issue of the Warsaw Signal. He says, the time for debate is past. Make your next words carefully, and he says, mine will be made with powder and ball. The Nauvoo Expositor being destroyed like that by the saints, those who call themselves people of God? <laughs> yes, Joseph and Hiram are true devils, as though they had served an apprenticeship in the infernal pit. Yeah. 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 They are steeped up to their eyes in sin. Monsters in human form. Look in the mirror, Cho, and you will see the reflection of the most detestable wretch that this earth contains. Now, if the safety of our lives and property cannot be assured to us by legal means, the only recourse left is to take up arms. It's not like
like this was the first time that they've been coming for Joseph. This had been going on for years, people coming for Joseph. And so there was that, all that anxiety and everything, and people were constantly dealing with that pressure. The mobs had grown increasingly threatening about what they were going to do, that they were going to come into the city and murder people, etc. So Joseph declared martial law during that, the time of that last speech that he gave. He indicated in some very strong terms that the uh, people of the city and the Nauvoo Legion were to go home and protect their families, and they were to close off entrance and exit from the city under the martial law. So in Nauvoo, you get a fervent following of Latter-day Saints who believed Joseph Smith despite all his flaws, and they saw plenty of flaws in him, but they saw a figure that was worthy of their devotion, someone who could promulgate doctrines that address their primary concerns, someone who has the charisma to maintain an audience of thousands when they don't have the benefit of a PA system. It is thought by some that our enemies would be satisfied with my destruction. But I tell you that as soon as they have shed my blood, they will thirst for the blood of every man and woman in whose heart dwells a single spark of the spirit of the fullness of the gospel. He doesn't expect them to believe him. He says he wouldn't believe his own story if he hadn't experienced it. He made a famous line there. He says, no man knows my history. No man knows me. Would, brethren, I could tell you who I am. By our industry. And that question then was, who is Joseph Smith? He was certainly a three-dimensional man. And it's not to deny the magnitude of good that he did or the strength of the movement that he founded. But there were some rough edges, which he said himself. Richard Bushman's biography is entitled Rough Stone Rolling. And as he rolled, some of the edges got knocked off, but some of them may have gotten a little bit sharper. I call God and angels to witness that I have unsheathed my sword with a firm and unalterable determination that this people shall have their legal rights and be protected from mob violence or my blood shall be spilt upon the ground like water, and my body consigned to the silent tomb. Will you all stand by me to the death and sustain at the peril of your lives the laws of our country and the liberties and privileges which our fathers have transmitted unto us, sealed with their sacred blood? said both to Hiram and to others, there is no mercy here. He at first thought it would be the best way to resolve the mounting difficulty was to just leave. He felt that if he left, that that would assuage the inflamed feelings on both sides. And so he and Hiram across the Mississippi with that in mind. He felt that if he were gone, he thought a lot of the anger was directed toward him. And maybe if you got the principal players out of the way, that uh, it might help to diffuse the tension. I think he honestly left under those terms. <laughs> Across the river, see the night lit by fire, swiftly we must go. Hear the roar, the deafening roar, the guns are getting closer. Row, row, row that boat, swiftly we must go. See the deer, the frightening deer, bounding 
for their safety. Flash of light to stop the night. Swiftly we must go. Joseph makes an attempt to flee to the west. Uh, he and his brother Hiram cross the river and uh, make an effort to, uh, prior to, to going to Carthage to, to head west and gave instructions to others to come meet him in the Rocky Mountains. They left in the middle of the night, and I think it was a leaky rowboat of some sort, and they were bailing while they were crossing the river to get over to Montrose and get out of Illinois. I think when we see Joseph deciding to cross the Mississippi River with Hiram to get out of town in Nauvoo in, in June 44, the first thing we think of is that he's trying to uh, avoid arrest. And well, look, that makes sense. He considers that an arrest will very likely lead to his death. Joseph and Hiram had left Nauvoo in an effort to to preserve their lives. Um, but that left Emma with their children and with the, the climbing, escalating tension. Just one set of rows. Just one Why should her husband leave in such a manner? Hiram barely kissed me goodbye. Joseph told me he would not return until the church was sifted and thoroughly cleansed. But now their absence has provoked some to call them cowards. Hiram and Joseph would never tolerate such a thing. I feel I must call them back before some catastrophe takes place. Perhaps the city is burned and the citizens massacred. We must deliver a letter before it is too late. And she wrote to Joseph and she said, you can't leave us hanging here. You've got to come back. She was desperate for that sense of security that she had felt with Joseph and that she yearned for with him. She's understandably nervous. She's been through this before in Missouri. I would speculate there's some of those feelings coming back again, almost uh, trauma returning in her heart and mind. And so she's torn. I I'm sure she wants Joseph to live. But on the other hand, I, I think she worries about him going west without her and, and without the family. And she's uh, expecting a child at this point. Of course, there will be a few of them. I guarantee He gets word from his own followers back in Nauvoo that, Joseph, maybe it's time to turn yourself in and we can handle this in the courts. Joseph Smith, by this point, though, he feared that things had gone too far. Joseph. Emma, she believes you should trust God and the courts. She wants you to return to Nauvoo. Governor Ford has promised you the state's honor of protection if you turn yourself in to face trial in Carthage. If not, he promises to occupy Nauvoo until you return. Our businesses and properties will be destroyed, Joseph. It will appear as cowardice if you leave now. Just days ago, you asked us to stay with you to the death. But will the shepherd run from the flock, leaving the sheep to be devoured? I'll die before I'll be called a cow. If my life is of no value to my friends, it's of none to myself. As I think about that relationship, I think about Joseph and Hiram making the decision to flee Nauvoo or not. That famous scene where Joseph says, uh, we're really gonna die if we go back, um, but you can decide, big brother, what are we gonna do? Let's go back. See this thing through. If you go back, I'll go with you. but we'll be butchered. If we live or die, we'll be together and reconciled to our fate. I think what you're seeing when he crossed the Mississippi only to recross it is that 
this was a very mortal man who suddenly had the impulse to leave and try to save himself. We are lost. And only upon realizing that that was a vain journey did he turn back. And at that point, it seems very clear from the historical record, he knew that he was doomed, that it was a matter of days, maybe, maybe even hours, before his life would be ended, and probably in a violent way. Oh, you cannot imagine how I felt as I saw you return. So many times you have left, and I imagined I would never see you again. I felt as if the Lord had worked his miracles once more for me. Hiram and I have decided it best to voluntarily turn ourselves in to the magistrate at Carthage on the charge of riot for the burning of the expositor press. Nauvoo seems best served by this decision. <sighs> Joseph, am I never to see you again? Oh, Emma. Emma. You were the wife of my youth, and the choice of my heart. My undaunted, unwavering, unchangeable, affectionate Emma. Will you train our sons to walk in their father's footsteps? You cannot promise me you'll come back this time, can you? The others are waiting. Joseph, you gave the children blessings, but you've never given one to me. Please, before you go. Write the blessing you desire. I promise I'll sign it when I get back. had to have had regrets about writing that letter. And anyone that's been through a traumatic loss replays the events happening before that loss, and I imagine that she did the same. But she also knew that he was a prophet of God and that he had a responsibility to his people, to the Latter-day Saints, and to his family. I cry, my father, oh son, the answers we lie together in yonder tomb the floors are laid the doors hung open it is done the gift the great brother Cahoon, have the floor laid and the doors hung to my sepulchre I will, Joseph. I will. The country widens, the grasses shimmer, the breeze is still now. I hear the birds. With all this silence, no place to hide, no place to hide. How did we get to this point in our lives? I'm going like a lamb to the slaughter. But I'm as calm as the sun this morning. I have a conscience void of offense toward God and all men. Brother Hiram, you are now in the clear. If I were to counsel you, I would say do not go to Carthage. If you go to Carthage, they will kill you. We continue forward. Illinois at this time is frontier America. We like to pride ourselves in the United States by saying that we've had a peaceful democratic leadership structure ever since the founding.
when in reality, American political history, especially on the frontier, has been riddled with violence from the very beginning. We sometimes think of the Nauvoo Clash as this special, exceptional, unique episode of violence, when in reality, it was pretty reflective of how disagreements were handled back then. With every new discovery, the museum was really taking on a life of its own. So, in cleaning this stone, I found this V here. Okay. We've got a matching V coming up here. So that stone would have sat right on top of this? Right. And I think that what we've got here are Nauvoo House stones. Well, let's see. What are we at this point? 13 inches? Yep, right at 13 inches even. Wow. I think what we're looking at is Nauvoo House Stone. We'll have to go down and measure and confirm. This is really exciting stuff. So here on the south side, this is what we're looking at. It's these kind of stones. See, we've got the lintel stone with the key on it. Let's take a measurement of this. This is... <laughs> it almost looks like I'm it. getting tingles up my spine. How about you? <laughs> it gets smaller. Oh, 13. 13. Exactly. Look at that. Perfect. So we've got five of these lintels still here on the building. We've got number six. Wow. That's all there is that's known. This is it. The Nauvoo house here, if you can imagine this, they were going to do four stories of brick. So this thing would have been absolutely huge. Each side would have been the length of the temple, just about. Oh, so this was way bigger than it the temple. It was huge. It was also meant to be the permanent home of Joseph Smith. Really? Yes. You know, overlooking the Mississippi River right here. The main entrance was going to be around here on the west side. And uh, they had made stairs for it. Oh, man, it was just, just an absolutely gorgeous building. This was commanded in the same revelation that the Nauvoo Temple was. Uh, here we go, verse 60. And let the name of the house be called Nauvoo House. We get the name in revelation here. And let it be a delightful habitation for man and a resting place for the weary traveler, that he may contemplate the glory of Zion and the glory of this, the cornerstone thereof. You know, we've got the temple being built up on the hill. We've got this being built using as many laborers as the temple is using. Oh, wow. <laughs> Sorry, I'm getting chills again here. So it all kind of ties in cornerstones and keystones. Yep, it brings it all together for us. <laughs> 
This is fabulous. Now, there, there was a noted historian of, of some fame <laughs> that talked about this being a cistern. So yes. tell, me, tell me what you think about that. He was wrong. He was wrong, okay. <laughs> he was wrong, yeah. All right. Uh, that was my initial thought in seeing this. Okay. Now that it's all excavated and everything and looking at it more, this is definitely a purpose-built doorway in the structure, and you really don't want a doorway on a cistern. Correct. What are some of the similarities of this vault to the actual tomb of Joseph? We're very similar with William Henry Harrison's tomb, particularly with the arched vault on the okay. inside. With the William Weeks drawings, he indicates water going along with it. Okay. Uh, right over here, we've got a well, which is a neat little add-on so there. So we've got a little water source. And then our dimensions are pretty close to what William Weeks had drawn up on his designs for the tomb of Joseph. Another similarity is its location in regards to the temple. There's indication that it would have been off the southeast corner of the temple. And where we're situated here is southeast of the Nauvoo like Temple. Due southeast, okay. Yeah. So we've got some neat similarities. So while we were filming this documentary, I got a phone call from a good friend of mine, Lachlan Mackay, with the Community of Christ. And he mentioned to me an illustration that I had used when I did my Tomb of Joseph article back in 2005, he said that there was another version of it that was really cool that I ought to take a second look at. Now, back many years ago when I wrote my article on the Tomb of Joseph, I used this image that was drawn up in 1849. We've got the temple block, we've got the remains of the temple, we've got the old Icarian schoolhouse over here and some other Icarian buildings. So we're essentially the same thing. Oh, but you can really see the... Yeah, we can see the structure much better here. It's written in French. Written in French. And I'm not a very good French speaker. Okay. But Lachlan Mackay went and had this translated. Okay. So we've got Ecole, which is the school, the Temple of the Mormons, the refectory, and Caveau de Mormon for this structure here. Vault of the Mormons. Very cool. That's the tomb right there. But the most important thing about the, the tomb is not whether or not the vault that we have is the tomb or we can find the exact spot that, okay, this is where it exactly was. The thing that's important is what Joseph Smith, to be able to be in that tomb with the rest of his family. That brings us to the doctrine of the resurrection and eternal families. And that's the important thing that we get to talk about by having the museum and the vault basically representing almost what the inside of the tomb might have looked like nonetheless. And so that's the important thing that we can take away from it is the story that we're able to tell through the device of that vault that just happens to be the right dimensions almost in the exact location that needs to be in, surrounded by stones from the Nauvoo house, which is where Joseph and Hiram were, were buried for a period of time. And so it brings it all together with the sacred nature of Nauvoo and what that meant to the gospel that Joseph was espousing at the time of his death. Carthage was really the culmination of all of those things that had transpired with their hope that if they killed the prophet, that they would end this movement. When the bodies came back to Nauvoo, the sense that I get is there was just overwhelming grief throughout the community. 
And that was the sentiment that prevailed, and it overruled any impulse to counterattack. Um, but immediately, we have leaders who are stating, avoid revenge. Don't do it, because if we do it, it really will bring on a full-scale war, which we can't win. The world is silent. Birds are singing. Sun is shining. Our tears are dry. Storm is passing. The darkness lifting. We move by duty in the light. Where now is Joseph? I do not see him. The last word shouted were so unkind. Pray he's found. Sanctuary, never the same, never the same, never the same, never the same. Emma and her children and Mary Fielding Smith and her children and Lucy Mack Smith were able to view the bodies of Joseph and Hiram privately before any of the public came through. And it was a devastating moment. And she said, Joseph, have they finally taken you from me? The fear and the anguish in that room at that moment, they all knew that life would never be the same. Joseph and Hiram were brought back. Emma was still terrified, and she remained terrified, actually, for years. I think pe many people who were hard on Emma just really don't understand just how afraid she was that they were coming for her sons next. When I think of the history of the martyrdom and the history of Nauvoo, that moment where hundreds, thousands of Latter-day Saints are brought through the Nauvoo mansion to see the body, I mean, this was one of the key moments in Nauvoo that would stick with them throughout the rest of their lives. concern was, can they prevent the, the body from being defiled? When that was finished, they closed up the house and they 
took the bodies out of the coffins which had been prepared and replaced them with sandbags that, that was about the same weight as the bodies. The people who had killed Joseph Smith may not stop with killing him. They may want to desecrate his body. There were uh, apparently at least four locations where the bodies eventually were buried. Emma actually had the, the bodies of Joseph and Hiram moved four different times under her direction. And each one of those burials, Isaac Manny, a very close friend of the Smiths, a black man that was the cook in the mansion house, dug the graves. He actually stayed up all night and watched over the bodies to make sure they were not disturbed. As I think of the tomb, which is really the central theme of this documentary, I feel a sense of sadness for Joseph Smith because, as we said earlier, I think a unifying theme for himself was always his own family in life and in death. And he never was able to achieve in death what he had hoped to achieve, which was to have a final resting place where he could be in the same presence as all of his family, which is what was envisioned when that tomb was created. To me, that's a very, very sad thought. I love how Nauvoo brings us together. Uh, I love that we share with our restoration cousins um, a story in Nauvoo. I love pilgrimage. Um, I research pilgrimage and historic sites. Oftentimes, pilgrimage takes us to places where prominent people suffered or prominent people died. And so for me, Nauvoo is a place of pilgrimage. I, I love the city of Joseph. I think he had this godly attribute of being able to see the best in others. He saw potential in people and allowed them to live up to it. Apart from whether he was a prophet or not, he was a remarkable, honorable, American citizen, a multifaceted person that I don't know how, in fact, he managed to keep all of the balls in the air at the same time. So Joe Smith both has the imagination to conceive and initiate this new religious tradition, while also being able to have the talent to expand it and make sure it maintains. He's also able to promulgate profound doctrines that both address the circumstantial problems of 19th century America and speak to people who are facing difficult issues of loss, of death, but also his energy driving charisma can lead to complications within that vision as well. He is not one to compromise on his vision. And so when his vision comes into conflict with circumstantial issues, with external opposition, with internal dissension. His knee-jerk reaction is not to back off and moderate, but often to keep pressing forward. So balancing this paradoxical legacy of Joseph Smith, that's something that scholars and believers and observers all alike are never going to be able to fully answer. In fact, that's why I find Joseph Smith such a fascinating, invigorating topic of study, because we're never going to be able to find a way to reconcile all these paradoxes. And just the voyage of investigating them is a joy in itself. The thing that I've learned more about Joseph Smith in researching the tomb was that Joseph Smith was an important man and he was an important individual in the, in the history of the church, but that wasn't the thing that, that made him important. The thing that made him important was the relationships that he had with his family and how important those relationships were to him, not just in this life, but in the eternities. Thinking of the, of the tomb and the importance of the, the tomb and, and what that meant for him, that he could be with his family, that's like a pure embodiment of that doctrine, you know, being together as a family for eternity. It's interesting to me because, of course, Emma was pregnant at the time, 
and the child that she has is named David. David wrote a song called The Unknown Grave. Um, it actually appears in one of the early, early hymnals for the church. There's an unknown grave in a green, lowly spot. The form that it covers will ne'er be forgot. Where the haven trees spread and the wild locusts wave. Their fragrant white blossoms or the unknown grave over the unknown grave. The heavens may weep and the thunders moan low, or the bright sunshine or the soft breeze below, unheeding the heart once responsive. Of the one who sleeps there in the unknown grave, low in the unknown grave. The prophet whose life was destroyed by his foes sleeps now where no hand may disturb his repose until the trumpets of God of the way and we see him arise from the unknown grave God bless the unknown grave oh God bless the unknown